Hello again, everyone. I am your host, Tosh, and this is Women in Games International's podcast called Cheat Codes. This is part two of our series on storytelling in the gaming space. Last month, we talked about creating a video game from the producer standpoint. And today, we're going to dive a little bit deeper. Where do we start? How do we tell interactive stories? Why is storytelling so important? With me today to talk about this subject, which I'm so passionate about, is Athena Peters. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you. Can you introduce yourself to our listeners? Yeah, my name is Athena Z. Peters. I've been storytelling probably my whole life. I started in theater when I was six and got into games in my, like, oh, I've been playing games since probably six. And then got into making video games, the video game industry in my early 20s, and have been here now for 20 plus years. And yeah, so I've moved from everything from being an actually, I started as an actor in the video games industry, oddly enough, an improv actor. And then I moved into a production design, and now I head up my own studio. I know the theme of improv is always yes and. Yes. So is the, is that something that kind of keeps you motivated as you go through your job and your work? Absolutely. I love this statement of yes and that comes from improv and use, utilizing it in any kind of collaborative effort or collaborative storytelling. I mean, it's a thing I pull in with my teams all the time, right? Especially when we're brainstorming and deciding what are we building next or how, what exactly does this feature look like, et cetera. That's, I love to do brainstorming exercises around that phrase itself, right? The yes and statement of things. I think I apply it a lot to my career also. Like I'm constantly thinking about what's the next thing, right? What's the next thing that we could build? Where's the next place that, that I can expand my knowledge? That, that people that I'm working with could expand. And so I think about it that way too. Yeah, yes, we're creating games and what? We're making community change. We're making change. So I think yes and it's a great statement to live by. <laughs> I love that because at its core, the platform of Cheat Codes is the fundamental right to, pl- fundamental right to play. And yeah. that's something that a lot of people don't necessarily consider. We put so many lim- limitations on play as far as accessibility, as far as access, and all of those things. But if we come towards it with the mindset of yes and, it's just so much more fun. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, and we open it up, right? So when you think about it, even if you're thinking about the audience that you're sending a game out to or creating a story for, if you just add in that phrase, yes, these people, and who else, right? Who else could I be reaching and continue from there? You just open so many possibilities and it makes us consider the how how can mm-hmm. we make this accessible i love that yeah, yeah. So what has been the highlight of the past year for you big or small oh gee this is the past year the past year has been rough so i've spent the last year trying to get my first game studio up and running i think definitely the highlights is the team of people that we've pulled together that have stuck through the fact that we have not gotten right the hope was to get funding really early and things didn't exactly go the way we planned along that we did get some good angel investments early on but not enough to like fully flesh out a game and there was concerns that when you start paying when you get to the point at which you ha- can start paying people and then all of a sudden you're not able to that you'll lose that team and that momentum mm-hmm. We had some other setbacks in the past year as well that kind of threw off whether or not we'd be able to keep the momentum going. The crew of people that we have working with us from like writers and designers, and we're actually a little, we're a bit producer happy mainly because the founders were producers to start with. But I think all of us have just, we're, we're so, we're so passionate about creating this studio that's founded by women and non-binary folks and most of us are queer and we want to tell right a story is for the people who are considered marginalized in the world but are actually probably if you look at our demographics of actual worldwide different demographics we're the majority right but but in what the world serves up we've been marginalized in our own industry we've been marginalized in the media right we want to be able to tell those stories and i think we're also passionate about it that even when funding dried up 
like we're finding other ways to keep going and keep moving forward. And so there's been a lot of progress, even in the last couple of months of just trying to get our initial app out there in the world. I was even, I was diagnosed with cancer just at the end of this past year. And I thought I had just been put in the role of CEO of this company. And I was like, I don't know how we're going to keep going with this, but like my partners stepped up to the plate and divvied up all the things that I'd been doing and said, these things we're in charge of, you tap in when you can, but when you can't, that's okay. And continue going to build this thing, which has just been, I think that's really been the highlight of the last year for me is that despite all the ups and downs, we mainly, we pulled together this amazing crew that cares so much about what we're building that when one of us needs to rest, it, it happens and things keep moving. So that, that really sounds like an amazing <clears throat> confirmation that you assembled the right team and you're doing the right thing to have everyone to step up to support you in the way that you need. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So how I love to talk more about your studio. How yeah. how did you create it? What did you see a need and then you just stepped in? Yeah, so I've been in the games industry for a good long time, working for some really large companies like NCSoft and Warner Brothers. I was most recently at for like seven years, and I was leading. I led Lord of the Rings Online for a while and Dungeons and Dragons Online. I launched our first two mobile games, Batman Arkham Underworld and Game of Thrones Conquest. And then when my time was done at Warner Brothers, I think after years of building, I was constantly building the games of other people or taking over games that other people had launched and then needed to be fixed or polished or grown after the fact. But I never felt like I was building the game for me. And there were several times that I tried to pitch games that were for like my demographic, right? The games that I wanted to play, not that the games that I launched weren't great games and I didn't enjoy them. I did, but they weren't I always knew they weren't built for me. And anytime I tried to pitch games that I felt like were built for me, I'd get a lot of pushback. I'd get a lot of like, well, the audience isn't there. We don't believe that this is a real market that will spend money. And I just, none of the numbers say that. Like, even if you do the data, that's not true. Like, women are actually the biggest consumers and will are actually the ones out spending. And even in games, right? Women buy the games, even if they're giving them to somebody else as a gift, right? So even if they don't play them, they're actually doing the purchasing. So the numbers are there. We know that they exist. And the, the reason, it's one of those like chicken and egg situations, right? Is maybe the reason why men aren't playing a lot of these games is because they weren't built for them. But right. if we built them for them, right? Then you see the opposite. So anyway, after a lot of time working in that frustration with that, I decided to just start my own business at Warner Brothers and just put all my life savings into building. And I stepped actually out of the games industry itself for a little bit and built a pub board game pub and built this little community space that where people could come and play board games and have great pub food and have a great bar atmosphere. It's this idea to bring families together, games over dinner, right? And that's where my game, my passion for games came from playing card games with my grandpa when I was little. And, and so I still remember that and I want to be able to cultivate that feeling and pull together with some folks and built that. I also had another company I started even before I left Warner Brothers that's an immersive theater company that I built with one of my best friends, Carol Murphy. And we wanted to create theatrical spaces that bridge it gaming mechanics, right? But, but wasn't full LARP, right? Not a full, but something that like your dinner theater crowd might come to and then we can lure them into the world of games. <laughs> Might just give them a little, a little bit of game. Trick you, you're right? a gamer now. <laughs> right. 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 So we create these spaces that it's like you can come in, you can you can interact in whatever level, right? You might just be an observer right and just watch other people you might hop in and do some a couple of puzzles or solve a couple quests for some character actors that are there or you might go like full in and almost come in with your own idea and your own character and really and so we create a lot of these like events and so my pub was a place to also have that space um and so then 
unfortunately I had only had my pub open about a year and a half before COVID hit. <laughs> and unfortunately, a space that is created for events can't really survive in a time when events were no longer allowed to happen. And then my, and then of course my theater company, we couldn't do anything either. And while I had just been experimenting with a game in my theater company that was a Regency era, an alternate, a alternative history, Regency era matchmaking game that we were working on doing as like a tea ball kind of experience. But then COVID hit and I and then I lost my pub and I was trying to figure out what do I do now with this creative energy and this need to connect people, which is a thing that I have all the time, right? I need to connect people, but I like to connect them in a physical space, like some kind of physical, even if it's not a physical space, some kind of something they can touch, they can hold. And so I decided to take that concept of this matchmaking game and I turned it into a letter experience. It had about, at, the, at its peak, it had 150 players all sending letters to each other through the physical mail. They would send them to my central PO box and I would then sort them and filter them out so that I knew what real person address they were going to and then would send them out there. I hired a number of writers from various locations across the world, various backgrounds to write up a brand new history of a world that was not before, like as if colonization had never happened. And I had, and all the writers wrote about their actual ancestral background had colonization not happened to their ancestors, what would they see their corner of the world looking based on that? And so I, we, so I went out and hired these writers and then many of them stayed on with me to continue writing letters as NPCs in this world to the players who were playing it. And then we would put together a monthly newspaper that would go out to all of our players that would tell them about things in the world, would also release gossip about them, and then, and then also basically give a character list uh, so you would know who you could write letters to them all, right? That's the other purpose of this newspaper. And so I ran that for the year over COVID and about, I wanna say about six months in, a friend of mine reached out and we should make our own video game company. And I was like, I just lost a business. I am trying to recover from that, get back on my feet. I'm not sure that it's what I'm ready for. And they were like, but this game that you're doing right now, this Romancing Jan letter game, that should be digitized. And I was like, I, okay, fair. All right, great. So yeah, I worked with that friend for a bit to try to figure out what that would look like. What is it that I wanted in a business, right? If I was going to start my own videos, game studio. What did I want this studio to be based on? And started talking about, can I create a co-op? Because that's another problem I have with the industry is the fact that what creators create, they don't own past that point, right? We get hired mm -hmm. in, we build a thing and then we go, but there's no royalties. There's no nothing long-term, right? You just get paid and put out. And so if something's really successful, you don't necessarily gain from that, right? As sure. a, as just a member of a studio. So started thinking about what, how I wanted a studio to be formed, like what its structure was and everything to try to make, not to make a more ethical video game studio. So not only do I want to be able to tell stories and open up the opportunity for other people to tell their stories that haven't gotten the opportunity to do so in our industry, but I wanted to create a space that then those people then own that, right? They own the results of that and that they're going to be paid get paid fairly, that they're treated fairly, that profit isn't put above their ability to survive. And started talking about that, started looking into people, other people out there who were interested in building a similar studio or had similar passions. And the original friend that I'd you know, been talking to, things didn't work out there long term, but in that process, what I met Nicolina Finska, who is my other co-founder, who worked at Rovio for years, launching Angry Birds and the many Angry Birds offshoot. <laughs> and then she actually formed her own studio for a little while called Unicorn Pirate. And when we named our studio Rainbow Unicorn, and then we found out about Unicorn Pirates, we had a very similar mission. It was almost kismet, but the Nicolina and I had to work together. So yeah, so she she's joined me as co-founder, and then we've got a number of other folks who've joined in since. Um, 
in various capacities. I brought in most of the folks who worked with me on the analog version of Romancing Jan are now writers and editors and designers on the digital adaptation of it as well. So I've been able to bring all those folks and I'm hoping to reach out back to more of the contractors that worked with me on that project and expand it. So we're really incorporating, really like the intention is to be able to incorporate the entire world and all of and all of the have all of the region represented and and so we're going from there but that's i think it was really like this idea of being able to tell this story and tell the story of this world and the uh, you know romancing jan is really about the romance and the passion and the politics in this like era in which things were massively changing, similar to what we're dealing with right now, where there's just huge discrepancies in who has money and who doesn't. And technology is changing so fast that people don't even know how to respond to it in that time frame. One of the things that always hurt me about reading things or even taking part in fiction of Regency era is that I'm a queer woman and I don't want to play a woman who's just being sold off to the highest bidder, right? Like my whole purpose is to just go rip, marry a rich man and then that's, that's not fun for me. <laughs> that's not a fun role play experience. For me, I want to be Mr. Darcy personally, right? I want to be, right. I want to be the person, right, that's on the mar marriage market that has a giant manor house and there's a whole bunch of women that want to like marry in for my fortune, right? That's more interesting play for me. So when I did it, a lot of it was like, can we take some of the aspects that are really interesting about this time period, but strip away some of the things that are hurtful and harmful to us? And one of my best friends, Nuance Bryant, who is a black woman and was talking to me about this concept in this game. And she was like, I think I agree. Can we also get rid of colonialism and slavery because I also want to play the pretty princess right. to the ball and I don't want it to be I don't want to walk into that and have people all of a sudden question me because of the color of my skin and introduce real world pain to me when I just want it I just want to escape right now it's like it. the time travel question people if you could travel back in time where would you go and I'm thinking where could I go yeah <laughs> right? especially within the, 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 the last 400 years I don't know how that would be skew in my brain so yeah. to, to consider a life outside of that especially in something that's come from it comes from imagination it's fantasy yeah i should be able to be whoever and whatever i i want yeah exactly I, yeah i think exactly. that's fair right yeah. I, yeah, I don't want to be limited in my own imagination either. Right, yeah, <laughs> exactly right. Like, I don't want that same, I don't want that limitation, right? When I go and I play, like, I deal with an, enough sexism and inequality and everything in everyday life when I go play. I, I, there are times, right, when that kind of play can be useful or thoughtful right. or whatever. But there's other times when you just want to go escape from it. That's yeah, like, based I, on, I remember yeah. being in third grade and someone asking, me, let's play Ninja Turtles. Who do you want to be? And I'm like, I'm going to be Donatello. And they're like, you can't yeah. be Donatello. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why can't I be Donatello? How can right. I be? He's, first of all, he's a turtle. What were you saying? Yeah, I was going to say, I had a similar thing with like playing He Man. And it was right. like, when I was a kid, it was like, no, you can only play this girl doll. Like, right. you, like, you have to be She Ra. I was like, I don't like She Ra. I don't like her one bit. I wanted to be Skeletor, though. So. Yeah. Oh man, that's a good character, right? Yeah. yeah. I enjoyed Skeletor. I, he just, he was sassy. And I think, yeah. <laughs> and I kind of yeah. like that about him. That's a fun, sassy character. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely one of those, right? Like, I, I think, and I think that's an opportunity that we have and something I want to see more in the game industry and just in our storytelling worlds, right? Um, like, it's nice to see, like, society starting to push forward, especially the younger generations towards like, let's strip away these boxes that we're putting ourselves in of like our gender and our sexuality and our race and be able to enjoy the differences that make us who we are, but not limit ourselves based on them. And while we're not quite fully there yet, we can give ourselves that in games, right? And in the stories we tell, right? We can open that up and say, hey, what if we didn't limit ourselves to that and instead just celebrated 
our differences but didn't restrict. And that's a lot about what this world that we're building is based off of handing over the you know, storytelling or the recreation of, of these various regions that were colonized by Europeans and saying, okay, what if it, what if this region wasn't, right? What would that region then look like? in 1811 or the equivalent of that and tell the story and then have our writers tell the story of their own ancestors from that perspective and i think it's opened up this beautiful way that we can then explore um oh gosh so many stories now based off that like all of a sudden just like cultural norms right like our festivals change like what's happening in the world that like the fashion changes because all of a sudden like not only is it a matter of blending, but then you also get the gender blending, right? Of this, you no longer have this very strict visual definition of what is a woman's outfit and what is a man's outfit. You can have some things in between. And that creates this really interesting art. I think it really opens up more stories. I've had people tell me like, if you take away the, the gender restrictions and the sexuality restrictions and the racial restrictions. Then what stories, where do you get the drama of that era? And I'm like, you get the drama, right. it's English, you get the drama now. <laughs> people, still, people still fall in love with the wrong people. Yes. There's still like people who are like marrying just to get money and not for love and yes. people backstabbing each other for business just deals because, or whatever. Right. <laughs> Humans are going to be full of drama. Regardless. There's drama. <laughs> there's drama in preschools. So there. Yes. So that's it's inevitable. I think it's quite imaginative and innovative to reimagine how it would have been before colonization or without colonization, because so many people just in order to bypass that, they fast forward, and mm. then they just they set everything in a future as if it's over rather than just yeah. built on top of that and it's still built on what can be a traumatic history for yeah. many people that's still the foundation of what the society is when you fast forward still oh yeah absolutely and then you're basing off of these very restricted thoughts and ideas that were heavily influenced by the people who told who were able to tell the stories at that time so right. I think one of the things that I really loved about this project is I, I specifically dig into his, historical stories about people that I would, historical people that I would want to highlight. Finding out about, you know, a gentleman in Africa who had actually invented the smallpox vaccine before anybody else. And being able to be like, oh, like in our world, nobody knew about him. And it, because it, all of a sudden it became this vaccine was invented by the Scottish guy back whenever why, and it, but Africa already had a vaccine for this right. beforehand, and so in our world we could add a newspaper story in there about this person and say he was a Benin scholar at this big university in Benin in our version of the world, and like all of a sudden it's okay now people get to find out about these historical figures that they maybe wouldn't have otherwise because if we base all of our history or background on just what's left in the European history books so many people got left out right like True. so many people didn't get you didn't you don't have the opportunity to learn about them I found it I found really what's really fascinating about re recreating the space is the ability to lend this idea of not only do we introduce new characters and new people that would not have existed otherwise because we've now changed what the shape of the world was but then we also get to re-explore people who did exist or maybe even give them a new try to imagine what how their life would have changed the world been different so you know some woman it was like there, there was a businesswoman in the u.s who was somewhat known but not very much so what if she had been born in a world where she would have been equivalent to a man in her world she'd probably be the head of some big factory setting and be a big name maybe she's in a member of the parliament or whatever because Right, her same knowledge and gumption and everything placed into a world where she had more freedom, all of a sudden we have opportunities to tell a new story for her, that kind of thing. And so I think doing that 
And yeah, I think for some, sometimes it's hard for people to go back and change because sometimes it can feel like we weren't trying to erase the pain. But I think that's just a matter of like where you want to be and what kind of story you want to hear right now. I don't think it's necessarily about erasing. It's about recreating or reimagining something that could have been different and exploring that um, versus there are a lot of opportunities to go in and learn about the real history. And that's also important to do, right? So that we know and we have that knowledge and we don't re redo. What is that? Those who don't know history are doomed to repeat themselves kind of thing. And that's also important. But I think it's also important that we create reimaginings for ourselves too. Right. Yeah, yeah. I fully agree. What, um, I guess one thing I really want to emphasize is diverse voices within storytelling. Can we talk a little bit about why it's important to elevate different voices? Yes, absolutely. I was actually speaking with my mother about this the other day when she'd come out to visit me and we were talking about books and I was giving some recommendations from books. And she found another author that popped up and said, have you read this book by this author? And I was like, no, but I haven't read anything by a cis hat white man in over 10 years. And she was like, I'm, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, it's true. I made myself a New Year's resolution over 10 years ago and said that I, at that point in my life, I'd spent 30 years reading primarily, uh, reading the works primarily of straight white men. And I thought for a minute, like all of my ideas about story and the, and of course, most of our history telling all this stuff comes from this one perspective. And it's not that that perspective doesn't like that there isn't value in that perspective as well. But if that's the right. only voice we ever hear that shapes our world yes. uh, and it limits us. And so I just decided to just go, let me just force myself to read other things and how does that change my reading experience and how does it change my viewpoint on the world and I immediately stopped being bored by the same what it felt like was the same story being rehashed to me over and over again all of a sudden I'm reading other perspectives other stories I'm getting a better understanding of what people of other backgrounds or other culture experience and go through, which gives me some amount of empathy, the changes they go through or be able to be able to connect that to some of my own struggles versus if I'm constantly reading from the perspective of someone who doesn't know what it's like to struggle with being discriminated against based on your sexuality or your gender. Um, like I luckily, I'm privileged enough not to have to face discrimination based on my skin color. But for those other things, right, then all of a sudden I'm like, when I read books by people who don't experience that, I sometimes wonder, is it me? Am I missing right. something? Like, why isn't my hero's journey as quick and easy as it was for this guy in this book? Right? right. And it's like, because my story is different because my experience is different. But when I can read the words of other people whose experience is different, then I can go, okay, I'm not alone. I'm experiencing this person also ran into the same experience I did, ran into the same blocks as I did. So I'm not alone. What things worked for them and how can I maybe help myself with those things that worked for them? Or you know, maybe there's another like struggle that is one that I don't understand being discriminated based on skin color. Like that is not a thing that I directly experience. But if I can read stories from somebody, I can recognize my own behaviors being things that maybe block someone unintentionally by me. But then I read and then I see that and I go, OK, there's some subconscious racism in me that I need to address and fix so that I can make this world easier for my friends that don't look like me or experience a different or have a different cultural background or have a different religious experience than me. Being able to hear those stories or letting folks tell their own take on that. When we do that, we all of a sudden are able to interpret how we could make things easier for all of us in this world. It just 
yeah, and be able to reach out and make people feel welcome and correct mistakes that we've made instead of just be like, oh, I don't know what I did, so how to fix it. It's, okay, let me listen to your words and then I'm gonna under that I'm more likely to understand what I did wrong. So I, I yeah. I really appreciate that you emphasize storytelling as a way to connect people. Oh yeah. It's I think we've been like, doing that yeah, correctly. Yes. From even passing down just an oral history, we're connecting ourselves to the people in the past. And also storytelling really humanizes people around us. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really hard to... And it's one of those things when you're getting to know another person and that line between them being an other and them being like my friend, my acquaintance, I feel like it centers around that. Have you told each other stories yet? Has there been an exchange of story? Even if I'm sitting like on a subway and you know, the person next to me in all we exchange is, hey, you're too close to me or whatever, right? We're still strangers. So all of a sudden that person opens up and it's just, oh, you know what? I had a hat that looked just like that and I got it from my great aunt and she lived in this place, whatever up and tell me a little story right then all of a sudden i'm like i have now i have a connection with you as another right. human being right and then i'll want to give my stories back all of a sudden there's an exchange and then we're not just two strangers on a bus it's like now there's been a moment there's been a connection we're human beings suddenly we see each other as yeah. human beings instead of just objects to, to objects and, ob and obstacles, right? and obstacles right? <laughs> yes. that you have to get around in your day. Yeah, no, it's another human being sitting across from you and you're able to right. share right. your yeah, stories with them. There are many stories that I've read, especially stories that have to do with a historical time period where even though the story is written in first person, as I'm reading it, it's a point where I take myself out of it because of the generational trauma, because of the historical trauma at work, I'm just reading it as if I'm a spectator and I want to be in in the story. And I think that since a lot of the writings comes from the same people in the same place, they don't necessarily, it's not that they're wrong, but they don't necessarily have to consider the historical trauma, the generational trauma. They don't have to consider those things. So it's not naturally included and I think once we open it up to more voices, the story does not have to be about that, but it's a natural consideration because of being othered by society so frequently. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that, and then I, and I think that the more we add people's stories, right, from different voices, I think the thing is that the richer our stories become right i i am one of those people who does not i don't like creating by myself I, I find it boring and awful maybe it's one of those i grew up in the theater so i've always been part of collaborative storytelling and so even when i'm doing design work for games it's very hard for me to do design work by myself i prefer to do it in a room with like other writers and artists like hopefully multiple disciplinary people and this was something i learned about a few years into my career, the first time I got to sit down in a brainstorming session that had a designer and an artist and an engineer all in the room together saying, okay, we need to create some monsters for this game. And the, I saw in that moment from being able to say like, me as the designer be like, oh, okay, I was looking up this cool like snowy spider like that, that's like furry. So it looks like a cross between a spider and a monkey thing and then like and then all of a sudden the engineer would be like oh i'm thinking about how we could animate the individual like legs on this thing and then systems designer is like i feel like it should have this kind of power because of that and then the in the and then an artist is just sitting there sketching and is like something like this and that's not what was in my head but that's <laughs> cool. and then and then all of a sudden it's, oh and then these powers i wouldn't even have thought of that and it's okay what if they also had this like society that worked like this because of that power you just suggested and what we would come out of these brainstorming meetings and i was just like i would be so in awe of 
what we managed to create in 30 minutes because whatever those creatures were that came out of those meetings were like a thousand times cooler than anything I had walked into the meeting thinking of in the first place as the design, right? And and it just sold me very much on it. And then we were already thinking about, because we had our engineer in there, right? We're already thinking about the technical limitations. Right. The artist is in there, so they're already thinking about what is the visual effects of this, right? The systems designer is already thinking about. And then all of those things are, came together in the creature that we created organically. It didn't feel like it was just something that was pieced together after the fact, right? Like we, there was just a box of Legos and everybody just randomly comes over and sticks a Lego onto the mass without any conversation. You just end up with a mess. But when you're sitting there together, putting all those Lego bits together and talking about it, right? then you're creating art, right? Then you're creating a cohesive piece. And so it's not just a matter of being able to tell the stories of individuals that are diverse because we want to hear their individual stories. The other part of it is that when we bring those things together, we're creating something that is more beautiful than we could have ever created apart. Right. right. And that's constantly fascinating to me. What, like any time, like you can bring a group of different people together, like what is the next piece of beauty that comes out of this, right? When we take, when we take some of these traditional stories from three different cultures and then we said, okay, and then those three different cultures met on this field and and had a bit of a blending pot then what came out of that right what does that look like you get something that we never would have thought out, outside of that and i think and then it creates a place for us all to connect too right because we see a little bit of ourselves as well as our friends and collaborators within right together i love that so yeah. I do know Wiggy is really passionate about creating cheat codes for women who are interested in the industry, who are just starting out, or for women who just need a little bit. Women and feminine identifying people who are interesting, interested in having that little push, that little motivation, or just even confirmation to keep going. So if you had a piece of advice for someone in the industry who's just struggling to tell their story, what would you say? I think for me, it's a matter of find your, find your, like your coven. <laughs> Our company is run by like a coven. So there's always three three people who have to make any major decision and rainbow unicorn. And so that's what we refer to as our coven. But you could come up with any term, right? There's a number of terms that for that, but who is your community? that you can reach out to that has like similar feel um, or a similar like goals you have. There's great, especially for women or, or other marginalized POC devs, there's fantastic groups that can be found on Facebook and Twitter and Discord. Women in Games is definitely one of those great groups. There's I Need Diversity in Games. There's um, I know I've seen Black Game Developers Group and Twitter as well. Finding those groups that that have those similar that one like a lot of times we can feel alone, right, in this industry, especially if you're working in a studio where like you might be the only person who looks like you and feel very alone if you're thinking about right there. But the great thing is that we have the internet. Right, as painful as the internet can be. What is great about it is that it gives us the opportunity to reach out to like really a worldwide database of people and you're guaranteed to find at least one other person that's like you, that's passionate about the things that you do. And like reaching out and finding those communities and then being able to just tell your story there. Say, hey, anybody who wants to meet up for a virtual coffee and chat about challenges that I'm having in the industry or that I really want to be able to do this creative thing or I really want to break into the industry but I'm not sure how do I do that I think there's so many of these groups out there that and there's so many of us especially those of us who have been in and remember how 
the struggle that we had when we were getting in. And like now, I want to be like, if somebody said something in one of the preview, I think it was just in one of the write ups recently about how small the industry is. I'm like, it's not anymore though. Right. It's, I remember when I thought like my little world of Austin video game developers was tiny and tight knit and everybody knew everybody. And then I had, I was forced to move out to go find jobs. And now there's things that come out all the time about people in video games. And I'm like, I don't know who any of these people are. <laughs> and I've been in this industry for 20 years. I've never met these people. I've never run into them. I know it's, it's not that small. There's actually a lot. And I've been in a lot of studios where it was like, I was the only woman there or I was one. And then there was a woman in HR and that was it. Oh, that's my friend, the one. Yeah. <laughs> now I have a studio of like about 15 people and one man and a couple non-binary people. And the rest of us are women. And there aren't a lot of those still, but. I'm also not, we're not the only studio, right? That is, there's right. those other women founded studios now too. And as I work with other studios, I do a lot of consulting work, I'm seeing more and more diversity in the studios than I'm seeing. So even if you're alone in your studio, you're not alone in the industry. And mm, so connect, really that's the thing is find those discord servers, find those Twitter spaces or Facebook groups and join them and just connect and so many people want like we want to encourage right wiggy is set up because we want to encourage people to come into this industry and help us change it that we are excited to talk to you about it and help listen to your story and help with our stories and see what we can do to overcome yeah that would be my cheat code go out find the group that most fits into your niche and start there and make some friends Find your people. I like it. Find your people. Yeah. <laughs> They're there. I promise. Yes. <laughs> if you're if you are there, they are there. That's right. <laughs> so thank you so much for tuning in to Cheat Codes. Thank you so much, Athena, for agreeing to be my guest. I am your host, Tosh. To stay in the know of Women in Games International, please give us a visit at getwiggy.com and subscribe to our newsletter. You can also find us on multiple social media platforms at GetWiggy. Take care and we will chat soon.